So that in a nutshell is the story of how the Yacht Master was established to try and drum up sales for the Daytona or the Cosmograph as it was known back then. And this was done at a time where the Daytona wasn't exactly a hot property. The Speedmaster, there was far more interest in watches like the Hoya Carrera, those models. So in a last ditch effort, Rolex executives decided to try and bring out a new name and the whole concept and the prototype was, was thought through but it never really saw the daylight. Now we're going to delve deep into Daytona law in this one. So deep that I'm going to be talking about a manufacturer by the name of Singer or Songer. I think to save myself the embarrassment, I'm just going to call them Singer. So with all of that said, let's talk about Rolex's first Yacht Master. One of the coolest executions of a regatta timer, I think, because of its simplicity and one of the rarest prototypes in the world. So what are the general impressions surrounding the Yacht Master today? It's a flashier Submariner. It prides itself on using precious metals platinums, golds, most recently titanium. And the Yacht Master too, it's large, it tends to also pride itself on using precious metals and it's a regatta timer. Safe to say that even right now, the Yacht Master with all of its broad collections and different models, it's a watch that still doesn't really know what it is. It's a model that Rolex has never really had a firm grasp on. Its design is a bit more loose, it's experimental, avant-garde, with alternative bright spot colors, with different sizes, all sorts of different finishings. And it's a piece that most love because of its diversity, because it's so alternative next to the Submariner, the GMT, and other variations. It's a great watch because it feels far more elegant. But with the new titanium variant making a splash, people are now looking at it quite differently. And the Daytona, well, it became popular thanks to circumstance. I don't think it, <laughs> it's fair to say that it wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for Paul Newman and his influence. So with that thought in mind that the Yacht Master was never a fully established watch, it never had a clear identity from the beginning. The original Yacht Master wasn't put into a Submariner case, it was put into a Daytona case. Now to understand all of this, we need to look back at the landscape of the 1960s, which was very different to what it is now. In-house wasn't a buzzword. Cases were outsourced, movements were outsourced. Velju, Lamania. Parts would be manufactured separately by a third party and hand-delivered to your door. I mean, salesmen would be coming to your work and showing you a selection of what they could offer. And you would cherry pick the types of hands that you would use, the types of plots, all of those specifics. But most importantly, at a time where computers and CAD CAM weren't doing the heavy lifting like they do today, you had artisans doing the work. And the Singer Dial Company, well, they produced some of the most amazing experimental dial designs of the time. Dials for names like Omega, Tudor, Universal Genève, and of course Rolex. Now they were pretty much at the forefront of avant-garde dial designs at the time. And we can agree that a lot of their designs, when we look at the catalogs, they belong in the 1960s. But they genuinely had one of the coolest jobs, just creating dial designs. Here's a date just, go wild. Here's a Submariner, have fun, do what you like. And there are so many amazing, amazing prototype dials that were fitted to cases but of course, Rolex had the final say, and many of these concepts were scrapped. It had to do with things like cost effectiveness, the fact that the design didn't necessarily marry with the image of the watch that the brand was trying to portray, you know, the usual stuff. But watches with these dials, with Singer or Singer dials, are the most collectible today. This is when you really get into single digit collector pieces. And it's mainly because these are essentially piece uniques. These watches are prototypes and they were never built to be purchased. You know, they were built to debut the design, probably show off what it would look like in a case and fully working, but never approved to be bought and sold. That then leads us to the Cosmograph Daytona, introduced in 1963 and was one of the least successful Rolexes of all time at the time. It's an important distinction to make. And I think it had to do with the fact that Rolex had been the pioneer in the field of hermetically sealed cases. Waterproofness was everything with a Rolex watch, no matter if it was the entry-level Oyster Perpetual or if we went as far up as the Submariner and the GMT. And most people just didn't see the Daytona, especially the early ones, as anything special because, I mean, if they wanted a chronograph watch, they could look at Hoyer, Breitling, Omega and the Speedmaster. I mean, 1967, they were, they were starting to make some headway, you know? One of the earliest shortcomings of the Daytona, the pump pusher case. The fact that these pushers weren't screw down. And it's believed that the introduction of models like the 6262 and 6263 were the ones that actually helped propel the Daytona forward into the future once they had screw down pushers. 
But while all of this was going on, 1967, Rolex saw the popularity of models like the Speedmaster and thought, we needed to drum up some interest into this watch. How are we going to do it? And the name Yachtmaster floated by in, in the boardroom. That's a great pun. This is probably conjecture and this is just me spitballing, but I think with a brand like Omega with the Speedmaster, Seamaster, Railmaster, Yachtmaster seemed like quite a good name. Omega obviously hadn't highlighted it or patented it in any way, so Rolex put it on their watch and they thought, let's try and attack it from a different angle. Put it on a, on a racing watch, a, a regatta timer. I mean, regattas are cool, right? Sailing and stuff. The logical choice was to put it into a Daytona case, and so they used the 6239 Paul Newman case as the template, and so they reached out to Sinja to realize this vision. Now, there are plenty of reasons why the Yacht Master didn't take off, why it wasn't put into production, chiefly because the Cosmograph at the time wasn't successful, so the idea of bringing out an entirely new property under the Cosmograph name was just... It would have been a disaster. But secondly, the glaringly obvious problem is that putting a regatta timer in a not so waterproof case is quite a failure point, wouldn't you say? It's like doing the same exercise with a Submariner, watch built for diving without a screw down crown. For those of you who know sailing, you, you get wet, like it comes with the territory. So this was a problem, and maybe that also bleeds into the design of the dial, which we will talk about in a moment. But the belief is that there are only three of these prototypes in the world, and they are the rarest Daytonas that you could possibly think of. But I look at the concept of this watch, the vision of the Yacht Master name, and where it was originally proposed to work, and it makes so much sense to be put into a Daytona. Why do I love this concept so much? Because of its simplicity, because it's quite uncompromising in a lot of ways. We tend to see that regatta chronographs nowadays and even at this time in the 60s, they tend to be solely built around the theme. So they'll use bright spot colors, they'll maybe only use one subdial, they'll break up the subdial into three parts or whatever else. It doesn't feel like a very functional chronograph for any other application apart from being a regatta timer, and that's limiting. The simplicity of taking a fairly plain Paul Newman dial and fitting that regatta timer at the bottom of it is great. And there's one model out there, I'll probably have to draw it up myself and put these concepts together because these pictures are so hard to find, where the minute counter on the right hand side has a red hand. And that red hand doesn't just point at the top, but also below, marking out this five minute interval that you would be using if you were lining up to begin a race. So not only does that hand record 30 minutes, but it can also be used to record this five minute stint. And I love the fact that it's not only utilitarian as a tri-compact dial arrangement, but simply because you can also use it to time the regatta if you needed to. It's just so much more practical and it's a brilliant execution. And in typical Cosmograph fashion of the time, red accents just tie it up so nicely. Now I'm guessing that this Singer dial was also a reason why Rolex never pursued it further. It was just too out there, avant-garde once again. But I just look back at this watch and I feel that it's a shame that this piece was scrapped and how different the Daytona climate could have been if this was adopted. Now, of course, we have the Yachtmaster 2, which is very much the regatta timer that the brand envisaged. But even then, it's a watch that's just not anything else. It's a 10 minute countdown timer. It has this bizarre bezel insert. It just, it doesn't do everything. Now, granted, these are niche watches to say the least, but the practicality and the usability on a daily basis seems to have gone out of the window. So that in a nutshell is the story of how the Yacht Master was established to try and drum up sales for the Daytona or the Cosmograph as it was known back then. And I think just for a fun exercise, I'm going to take the current Daytona and try and make it into some kind of Yacht Master amalgam. As all of us know, four digit Daytonas are highly sought after and collectible because of the name and the affiliation with the watch. But I think ultimately it's the simplicity that won out at the end of the day. It's the fact that these chronographs pride themselves on using three lines of text on their dial. The fact that they're very open, easy to read. And for all intents and purposes, these watches present as very utilitarian, with a touch of flair when we look at their dial designs. So it is a story of what could have been. And sometimes those stories are the best. So the Cosmograph Yachtmaster, a watch that a lot of us know about today, but it deserved a highlight because its design just feels effortless. It's so simple, but feels so right. And I just wish that this idea was taken further. So a few years ago, I used to make these sorts of videos where I would go into niche watches, niche properties, and talk about them in detail. So maybe we can start that up again. But until then, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you in the next one.